And now I'm very excited to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Evan Chavitz is a board certified oral and maxillofacial surgeon who practices in Scarsdale, New York. His practice is almost exclusively focused on implant surgery and related procedures with particular attention on digital applications. His office is fully digital with a full-time lab tech, a five axis mill, multiple 3D printers and intraoral and laboratory scanners. This allows him to work hand in hand with his referrals and the dental labs from planning to restoration. He lectures nationally on these topics and consults on the digital aspects of implant dentistry. Dr. Chavitz is the chairman of the board of advisors to Toro College of Dental Medicine and is an associate professor at NY Medical College. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Evan Chavitz, DMD. Hi, Dr. Chavitz. Welcome. Hi, Linda. You hear me okay? Everything? We hear you great. Good. Jay, you hear everything? I want to thank people at CE Zoom and Linda for helping set this up and definitely Jay from Cornerstone. Jay and I became friendly a little bit outside of dentistry. During the height of COVID, we have a couple of printers in the office and we were helping print face mask shields and related stuff for some of the hospitals in the New York area. And I think we got very popular with it. And I got a little bit more of a demand than we could. And Jay, who also is like me and wants to work and do stuff, wound up going in and printing and FedExing and doing it all basically by himself. So after that, we became much closer and good friends. And he's helped me a lot in my digital journey and my support in helping teach and helping us with what we've learned. So I'm going to share my screen. Everybody sees what we got here? Yep, looks good. Good. So lecture really is the importance of laboratory support for the restorative dentist. And it really comes down to the relationships. As a specialist, I realized this a couple of years ago that we work basically on getting patients from our referring dentists, particularly my implant patients generally don't come in de novo to my office. They almost exclusively show up from a dentist who sends them over and says, can you evaluate this? Can you do this? And we work and support and based on the feedback they get, based on the quality, hopefully of the work, and the whole patient experience, timeliness, how happy they are, we get more work or we don't. So I realized in a lot of ways, the lab is very, very similar to how we function. And in addition, when you start to place implants for bigger cases or tighter spots or bone that's a little bit angled, it's really nice to hop on a call with a lab prior to doing the case and saying, if I can do this, can we restore this? Or do you have a suggestion? Should I go a little bit deeper? Maybe we're going to do a multi-unit. Maybe we're going to do an angled screw. And historically, surgeons never did that. And, and we didn't really contact the lab. And then at the end, the case went to the lab. And there's way too many cases that we all have that were ended with, can you just make it happen? And we really don't need to be doing that anymore. So communication works for everybody. And the lab has a lot of great support in the digital realm. As far as housekeeping goes, I do some consulting and lecturing for some of the companies, Strum and Nobel, 3Shape and Anzan Lab. No one is supporting this lecture. There's no commercial support and everything with CE Zoom is, is within that disclosure statement. This is me, this is my email address. If anyone has a question, if they wanna tell me something, ask something, whatever, they want a little clarification on something I spoke about, you could always feel free to get a hold and email me. I'm an oral surgeon who's been in private practice for 27 years, feels very old. My practice at this point has evolved to become almost exclusively implant related, implant surgery, digital planning, bone grafting and stuff like that. I don't go to the hospital. I don't do any of the maxillofacial anymore. My practice is 100% referral based. We do no direct to patient marketing. We do no SEO optimization. We work 100% from I want a dentist to send me the patient who knows us. So how did we build that? By being available. Same way I was kind of half joking about Jay being available, stepping up and donating all his time and resources and printed material when people needed him during the height of COVID. It was a great effort. It was availability. There are times that I've been on a phone with him Sunday at 7 a.m. reviewing a case on both our ends. Sometimes I'll help him, sometimes more he helps me and goes through some stuff. 
knowledge and education. I'm a very big believer that you can't do what you do well if you don't have an idea of what everybody else involved is doing. If you don't understand the restorative, you can't really do good implant surgery if you don't understand the limitations, if you don't understand where parts and pieces are going and, and what's there for you and not to, to handle. So I'm always a big believer. And when I lecture to residents or surgical specialists, I always kind of joke with them and say, you got to remember, you're still a dentist and go back and learn this. And the same goes for people who may not place implants. It's still nice to know some of the limitations. That's great with the advent of digital and text messaging and whatever, WhatsApp and all the stuff that we use. It's super quick. I, I've become my kids where I just take a screenshot, snap a picture and send a text and go, we cool with this. What do you want me to change something? And then they look, and if they want it, we can make a bigger call, do a Zoom, do a Teams meeting. But this really has great availability and great support for the referrals and the labs. It's also a matter of relationships. It's a matter of having trust. It's a matter of knowing that not everything goes the way it needs to go. I do a fair amount of immediate load provisionalization in my office. We do some of it on our own. I, at times, will have a provisional debond. Patient comes in, we'll fix it. But the dentist knows, the patient knows that we're trying and doing. We all have little hiccups. We all have a screw that we can't get out or something that we did not go the way that we wanted. And we work together and support each other. And like I spoke about before with communication, especially in the digital age, it's great. Everybody has that availability on their phone. I take a quick screenshot, take a picture, send it off. We can do it from anywhere that we're standing and go through that. Digital dentistry is really the crux of what I want to kind of go through tonight a little bit and talk about how we integrate that with the support of the dental lab and the dental lab uses it for support back with us. I'm a big advocate of having an intraoral scanner. I think they're great. I think they're accurate. If you want to get into a discussion of complete full arch implant restoration, we can have that discussion of maybe it is not perfect yet, but short of that for study models, for aligners, for night guards, we also have flippers. I have a lot of patients that come to my office after they've seen the dentist in the morning who says to them, no, I can't re-cement that crown. It fell out. It's number nine and maybe I can't do an immediate load that day, we will scan it, get the file over, and Jay will have a flipper back pretty quickly. It really works well. It goes straight across. The accuracy is there, and I believe they're using a fully digital workflow. And that's the word that we all need to kind of learn, workflow. And workflow really is nothing from where you're starting to where you're ending. If I'm going to take a tooth out on a patient, number 16, just not a wisdom tooth. I'm going to go in, we're going to introduce ourselves, we're going to take a medical history, we're going to look at the x-ray, we're going to do a clinical exam. We're going to explain it to the patient, we're going to go through all the steps, give them proper consent with risks and benefits and a little bit of some potential complications. We're going to give them local or sedation, take the tooth out, maybe give them an antibiotic prescription or some analgesics, and then we're going to give them post-op instructions and give them a bill and let them go on their way. That's the workflow. That's how we do it. In my office, every patient gets discharged by me. No one goes to recovery room without me going a second time awake or asleep to go. The same thing goes with taking an impression. The same thing goes when you're doing a crown. It's just a matter of how we do things in order. But I know it's something that comes up, and I think it's overthought sometimes. The next is we talk about CAD and CAM. CAM is computer-assisted design. That's the software that we're using. If I'm going to scan an implant with a scan body and send it off to the lab for them to make a crown, they're going to use ExoCAD or they're going to use 3Shape or they're going to use CARES or some type of computer software and design that crown. That crown will have all the parameters set in it in the software through the files the companies release so we can create that crown so it sits on the appropriate tie base or it sits on a abutment that they have made. They can actually do an abutment and a crown that are perfectly fit together that neither of them have been created and send one file to a mill to make the abutment and one file to a mill to make the crown. So that's the software and the design portion. The next is the manufacturing, and that's the application. 
Again, milling is very big, particularly in final crowns when we get to using zirconia, sometimes with Emacs and some of the other materials. We're starting to get into mill dentures a little bit. And we're also getting into printing. Printing is very, very, very quickly coming up and having tremendous offerings that it didn't have before. For the first couple of years, we had any lab material in our office. It was all done through a subtractive process in a mill. Now it's additive, where we have the different resins and they're light cured. We put the file into a nesting software and it prints and we get back the crown. We're going to show you that a little bit. Then we talk about standard of care. And this I always just put in because in this day and age, this shouldn't really be an issue or a concern, but it is something we should talk about that if I'm taking out number 19 and the patient wants to discuss replacement, we are obligated to tell them you could do nothing, you could do a partial, you could do a bridge, or you can do an implant. We do have to offer them, and we have to do the same thing that any reasonable professional would do in that instance. When we send a file, if we're doing a digital scan to the lab, we're going to put a scan body in, and we're going to screw that into the implant, very similar to how we do a open or closed tray impression. And if we look here, we have nine scan bodies. They look markedly different. Some are blue, some are smooth, some are jagged. One looks like it's metal. And the interesting part is every one of these offer the same implant. So why is this important? Because you want to use the one that your lab is going to be comfortable with. This is a desk scan body. I happen to like this. I'm going to talk about it a little bit later on. We use them all the time. And I know that the files are in the software. This is, I believe, a CEREC. If they have not released the CEREC files to the lab, when you scan this, they won't be able to create a crown just because it fits. The same with ELOs. Some of the ELOs don't allow what we call local milling, which means when we get a file in or the lab gets a file in, they're going to have to create that crown and maybe send it to the company that owns the implant to create it, and that becomes a more expensive process, more time-consuming process, and something that we have to know, and we have to make choices, whether we want to go with some aftermarket, whether we want to go with original manufacturer, there's advantages and disadvantages to all of them. I know the ones that we use and the ones that I, I advocate for, I'm very comfortable with. So let's talk about the first thing, immediate placement. Talked about that patient that shows up in the office, crown is out on number nine. He goes, I got a business meeting at 10. Can you possibly re-cement this? And you look and go, not a chance. So what we're going to do is after the appropriate exam, the appropriate radiograph, maybe a comb beam, we're going to talk about placing the implant fixture at the time of extraction. That means we take the tooth out and we put the implant in. Immediate provisionalization is placing a provisional restoration at the time of implant placement. It does not have to be within 30 minutes. It can be up to a day or two or sometimes three days. I know very often that if we need to, we will send a file over to the lab and Jay will get it and FedEx it over and have it designed. Sometimes the patient comes in towards the end of the day and we'll bring them back a day or so later. When we do this with our full arch cases, we can't design that as quickly. So we definitely do it sometimes two days later when it's indicated. Over half the implants in my office are immediate. Not all are immediate loaded. Many of them receive an implant, immediate, temporary, or a gingival former. A gingival former is a custom healing cap. When we put healing caps on implants, they are perfectly round. Unfortunately, teeth are not perfectly round. And when we put that implant, particularly into a front tooth, the gingiva doesn't always form back the way it would around the tooth. So what basically the lab is doing is creating a crown and cutting it off a little bit above the gingiva, like the height of a healing cap. But from an anatomic point of view, it allows the gingiva and promotes it to heal in the same form that the final crown will be received. It's not always productive to do. I mean, when I have an emergency in the middle of the day and a patient comes in and they need to do an immediate implant, immediate load, the staff needs to start scanning, we need to take a comb beam. We're breaking out every ancillary thing we have to do that takes a little bit of time but back to how I grew my practice, it's through availability, it's through support. The same thing with the labs. They're busy, they're running around, but I know Jay has never hesitated to design a temp for me if I needed an STL designed and sent back. When indicated, the results are better. 
It does require some agility because it disrupts the schedule and the flow of the office. He has two patients that came in. We'll talk about both fractured their front tooth, one number eight, one number nine. If we look here, we can see that neither of them are restorable. This was a good friend of the dentist on the upper left. The one on the lower right was a 19-year-old college student who fainted. And these are the provisionals. These were lab fabricated. These are not finals. These are both at one week post-op. We were able to get the teeth out. We were able to get an implant in. We were able to do it virtually, if not flaplessly. The patient on the lower has a much thinner biotype. We don't want to mess with that gingiva. We don't want to start rolling things back. You can make an argument that she has more gingiva on my provisional than she does on her natural tooth. I'm not concerned. We can always deal with that easily. It's the too little gingiva. On the top, the lab went and Look how nice they match the coloration. Again, it was the dentist friend, and he wanted to go above and beyond. We don't need to always do that for something that's going to be in for a little bit, but we can. It's a nice gesture, and we want to make sure the patients are happy. This guy is a psychologist, the one on the top. He was able to go back to work within a day, didn't miss a beat, didn't have to wear a flipper, was comfortable, and when he healed, the ginger heals beautifully. It has great emergence and great papillas. So how do we do this? We do this through planning and communication. So when do we do an immediate placement? And this is also the why. We do have faster healing time. We do have an improved tissue response. We have a much better and happier patient. They don't have to wear a flipper. Patients of mine that we've done implants on them or their spouse years and years ago, and now they come in and I have to do a flipper. I don't do a flipper on them and we can do these immediate lows, they're, they're happy. They will send you more patients. They will tell their friends. We need to have science behind it. And if anyone is familiar, Dr. Booser is really one of the leading experts on immediate implant placement, discussing when we can do it, when should we do it early, when should we wait, and when should we do it late. This just happens to be an article that he did with some top people, and I always joke that it came out on my 50th birthday, so I keep that in mind. So what are the indications or, re or reasons we can do it? Patient comes to the office and you send them over to the surgeon, you call the lab and say, we may have an immediate load, we're gonna scan it if we can do it, and this is gonna be the shade. We need to have an intact facial bone wall of greater than one millimeter, meaning that buccal plate needs to be one millimeter. You don't wanna start grafting with membranes. You don't mind grafting gaps, but you don't wanna graft and put membranes. Biotype really refers, if you're not familiar, with the thickness of the keratinized tissue and the gingiva. The thicker is better. As we said, a flapless procedure is always preferred. And these implants need to be a little apical to the midfacial crest. They should not be mid-root, but they're going to be a millimeter or so below the crest when you're looking at it directly from the buckle. And now if you're looking from the occlusal, the gap between the implant and the facial bone should be at least two millimeters. If we can't do this, then we bail. And I tell patients all the time, I go, if you wanna try it, we will. If I think we're gonna have the same result as if we did this the traditional way, but I always reserve the right to call an audible and cancel the implant or cancel the immediate load if I don't feel we have the right criterion that we met. Presence of infection probably will preclude that does not mean a little isolated periapical granuloma that's not infected. It means fulminant infection, pus, and severe pain usually indicates if it's not a pulpitis, but it's more of a periodontal type infection. We don't want to do it. Very thin biotype, presence or absence of buccal plate, anatomic structures. We need to get stability. If I'm going to do an immediate implant in number 13 and I want to do an immediate load, or just an immediate implant, I may want to grab some of that bone apical to the root. If I'm starting to get into the sinus and I need to do a sinus, we're not doing it. It's just not gonna happen that day. And if there's a significant amount of grafting, we're not gonna do it. Some of the criteria, and this is debatable, is there is a difference between torque. Torque is the ability to resist turning or shear forces. And Ostel, I think Bluebird is the new one, ISQ values, implant stability quotient, is actually a little pin that goes into the implant and we hit it with a radio frequency device that will give us a chance to kind of measure the actual stability, not just that one moment in resistance of torque. 
and the over 70 on the Ostel scale, we generally will be comfortable loading. But again, it's one of the parameters. It's not the sole parameter. Implant sizes, if for some reason you're putting a six or an eight millimeter implant in, you may not want to immediately load a multi-cusp tooth. It's just a matter of judgment of what we're going to do. Heavy smoking to me is always a big one and associated risk factors such as uh, diabetes, bisphosphonate use, and stuff we've all had lectures on. So here's the young girl. She went to the ENT, got some steroid shot in her nose or something for sinus issues. Her mother lives in Rhode Island. She was at SUNY Purchase studying opera, actually. And she went to the front desk, fainted and fractured number eight, came in. I called mom and said, what do you want us to do? We need to take the tooth out. I think I can get an implant in. I can't promise that I'm going to be able to get stability. She does have the bite that we were able to potentially get her a crown and keep it kind of out of occlusion. There's no alveolar fractures. But we said we may have to make her a flip, but we don't have it available. She'll have to deal for a day or two. We could do a bonded bridge. We don't have a tooth that's intact. That would be on the dentist to either take the crown from the tooth or find a denture tooth, maybe put some rib on, attach it to the lingual of the teeth and try and get it together. Or we can do an immediate low temp and we can either do that chair side or milled. So here's where the tooth came out. And here's where we see if we look where we want that gap. You remember what I said, there should be a greater than one millimeter gap between the buckle plate and the implant. And when you look at my picture, we were able to achieve it. If you do this early on, it almost looks like it's too big, but you want that stability. We got a 12 or 14 millimeter implant in. We don't want pressure on that buckle plate. We want to maintain that convexity and we want those papillas. So then we graft it up and you can see the implant there. This happens to be a Stroman BLX. And we made her attempt that we were able to mill. At the time, we didn't have angled screw. I was fortunate to get the BLX a little bit earlier than when they came out, and it was a good thing and a bad thing. The unfortunate part was we didn't have the full restorative line, so in the provisional, we still had to do this as a screw hole through the buckle. So let's talk about making this temp. If we look here, let me lower this for a second. Oh, forgive me. If you've ever wondered how this works when you take out the tooth and do an immediate load, again, we want to do this flaplessly if we can. I prefer using periotomes. Teeth, if you've looked at, back to the discussion of why we need to know what everybody else does, sometimes the apices of these teeth hang very close to the buckle, and you're literally completely redirecting, because if I were to put that implant into that socket, it may come out perfectly straight without having to use a custom abutment or an angled screw but I would be violating that one millimeter gap rule. So then the implant goes in. And we get it torqued. And now the question is, how are we gonna make this temp? Literature varies, 35 Newton centimeters may be okay. Back to the same picture I showed you of how we had it. We hand tighten a engaging temporary coping. We don't want non-engaging for a single unit, though for short time you can do it. Cut it down to size. And we may block it out very similar to how we do a all-on type conversion so we don't get anything locked into the implant. And then we fill that in and we can use different methods. We can unscrew the temporary after it's been looted a little bit and then fill in the gap. We can try and do as much as we can in the mouth. But ultimately, at the end of the day, what we really want, and this is back to why the lab really is important to be involved in this, is that we want this to be smooth and polished and perfect. And it doesn't magically show up like it does on that little cartoon they showed us. Taking a tooth like this and doing an immediate load, chair side restoration after speaking to dozens of dentists is a minimum of 30 minutes to do it properly. To do it in five minutes, it's not going to be polished. And even on this picture, and I'm going to ask Jay at the end, I think it's a little over contoured on the buckle. 
we want it to be under contoured because we don't want to push that gingiva up. We've messed with it a little bit. Even if we've done it flaplessly, we kind of got into a couple of fibers to get in there. And the temp goes in, and that's how it looks. So chair side is the one we do traditionally. Chair side, again, these are usually an emergency. They're usually time-consuming. We don't wind up highly polishing these. We may have voids and gaps and proper contour. I still think that one on the buckle is a little over contour on the right. We want that as smooth. Literature is starting to show that what sits against the gingiva is super important. They're actually starting to even advocate not staining the zirconia on the gingival contours where it sits. Leave that alone. Some people say just raw scented zirconia, titanium are the best things to sit against gingiva. Don't glaze it. Definitely don't stain it, at least what's going against the sulcus inside. The other question is how much is time worth? These cases are emergency. Some of us are not set up to handle it. I think it's going to take about 45 minutes to do a really good provisionalization. If we rush this, we're going to wind up with erythema, with plaque, with calculus, and that's going to lead to mediators of inflammation, which are going to cause the implants to fail. The temp cylinder costs a decent amount of money, too. So is there a better way? And this is back, why should the lab be involved? Well, first, it's just easier and better. Number two, I know this came up a little white, because this is better. This is a printed provisional that's looted to a tie base that has no gap, that sits perfectly highly polished, against the gingiva, and there's no real porosity. We don't get water absorption. We don't get bacteria in growth. And it's a lot better than this. And the truth is, this was a provisional I took out of a patient that I treated. And the dentist had said to me, I can do a provisional in about five minutes. And I realized why he said that. This literally now has major gaps in a couple of weeks or two months when I saw him. We were getting calculus forming on here already. That's not good for the gingiva, that's not good for bone, that's not good for the crest, and that's not good for the longevity of an implant. So the couple of articles that I kind of found and go to is one with Tornow and Chu and Sato. The use of an anatomically contoured provisional may provide a platform to promote peri-implant soft tissue healing and minimize remodeling. When we look, and I'll show you some pictures, the buccolingual dimensions get amazingly preserved. The gingiva gets amazingly preserved. We don't have that bleeding on probing. We don't have that floppy looking papilla. And it just heals. It also keeps bone grafts in better. This is a great article if you want to geek out. They actually took PMMA and they gave it to lab techs and dentists. And if you remember in dental school, we had to do it in the proper measurements. Then when you got out of dental school, we just kind of did a little powder and liquid and threw it together. And then the lab techs did it with the proper measurements and under vacuum. And the difference of bacterial adhesion, color change, how much water got in there, porosities was huge. And just by eyeballing it the way that I was kind of taught and did it was it's a little runny, add a little more powder. It's a little more powder, add a little more liquid. You're not doing the proper ratios of the manufacturer. This is another one that they discussed. Oops, sorry. Uh, CAD cam against manual restorations. And this is immediate temporization in the aesthetic zone evaluating survival and bone maintenance. In a summary, for whatever is engaging the implant, the smoother the surface, the better the healing, better the bone response. Immediate placement and immediate attempts work when the proper selection criteria are used. The less the tissue is manipulated, the better the healing response of the tissue and the bone supporting the implant, both surgically and restoratively. CAT cam temps that are lab finished offer the best clinical outcomes when compared. So here's a workflow in my office. We put our scan body in, we scan that. We then either send it to the lab or we can do it with a lab tech. We design the temp on the software and then that gets printed or milled and then looted or cemented to a tie base. That's a stock component. So we know what engages in the implant is gonna be very, very tight. There's not gonna be a gap. There's not gonna be mobility. Now, the production can be done by the lab. The labs are set up. This is their livelihood. They can do printed or milled. For a dentist to do it, we need a printer or a mill. But in addition, we need to have the right color. A2, A3 and a half, B1, B2. Every one of those requires a different bottle of resin. Every one of those requires a different puck. 
we also need the appropriate tie base in stock. On the flip side, working with a lab, we need to coordinate and deliver it to the dentist office. With FedEx, we can get that out pretty quickly. If you're going to do it, are you going to design the STL? Or are you going to send that file to the lab, let Jay design an STL, and maybe you have a printer, maybe you got the new Sprint Ray, or you want to do it yourself, and let him do the design and send it back to you. It's still a tremendous savings. What do you charge for the design to the dentist? I don't know. That's something that he can answer questions. What do they do? I know that we keep the fees very fair and reasonable. It's really, particularly on patients that aren't prepared for a flipper. I'd say half my immediate loads didn't know they were coming in that morning. They're not really scheduled. They usually show up and we get this done and they blow out their day and they're crabby and the next time they come back, they're happy. Either way, we have huge dentist and patient relationships and satisfaction on building. We look, we do these often. We do them with four unit temps. We do them with full arch on the lower, the top is not mine. We do that all the time. When I do them, sometimes the temporaries don't match as well. One of the things you have to realize, especially if you're going to have a screw hole on the buckle, that PMMA, if you're gonna produce it, or resin, if you're gonna print it, has a different light refraction of even the same shade of composite. And a real neurotic patient will see a little bit of that hole and you have to tell them and go through it with them. So I want to show you a case where we did collaboration with a lab that we can talk about now a little bit bigger. We do a lot of stage cases in my office. And one of the things we do is very often I'll have the dentist prepare a couple of teeth. They'll send me a scan or send the lab the scan and me the scan. The lab, Jay and crew will knock off the teeth except for the prepared teeth. And they will create a provisional using that same file i can mine that up when i create a surgical guide and we can wind up now collaboratively correcting occlusions having a temp and at the end of the case if i'm doing the implants i don't need to send a patient back to the dentist to start relining a temp or prepping teeth everything is done and i just had a patient in today that we had done one on on four teeth i put six or seven implants in a few weeks ago and I had done the bottom years ago. I go, this is so easy. He goes, I saw Charlie did a couple of preparations and then came back and everything was set. So this is something that we can see with proper lab support, we can do this. And this is done with one of the dentists in my group who's in Ohio. Young guy, phenomenal dentist, does a lot of implants. I kind of helped with a little bit of the guide and a little bit of the planning and our lab tech was involved. Jay will be getting the final of this case. We did this just as a proof of concept, but absolutely is something that we actually learned a lot from him. And you can see here that she has two teeth that are totally out of the arch form. She has gingival recession, completely not where we want. So October 20th, Cole calls me to discuss the case. 21st, the next day, the STL and the die comes, the intraoral scan and the CAT scan was sent to me for review and workup. Send it to Jay, you'd send it to the lab, they would get it together. We review and formalize a plan. He then prepares the teeth we discussed. The lab gets it, reviews everything, makes a provisional, we make a guide for him. And within a couple of days, so within a week or two, the procedure was performed. And if you look here, you can see there are malpose teeth. Radiographically, she's got decay, she's lost bone. And we can also see we don't have posterior teeth. So what's our problem list? Patient has a failing upper and lower dentition. She wants a fixed restoration. She doesn't want removable. I hate patients wearing removable. There's nothing worse on a big bone graft or a bunch of implants, even if you do them two stage, to leave these with the denture sitting over it. So the plan was for Cole to prepare a few teeth up top and a few on the bottom. And like I said, we would take the scans in the lab digitally extract all the remaining teeth, make CT guided templates or guides for the implant surgery and have provisionals made. These SDLs are at the lab now. Jay can get them and use them for the finals. When we do the implant born temp, the next stage, he will be involved and take care of it and finish that up. So what we see was the digital wax up was done. If you remember how her teeth looked, we we're able to straighten this up. So we can do a digital wax up very similar to how we did in dental school for those who are old enough with the white wax where we sat there and 
moved everything around, except now we can just do this if we're happy. We can add this to our planning, and even though her teeth are not where those teeth are, we can design the implants to go where we want. We make the design of the temp, and we make the guides. And here we are. It's a little bit hard to read, but you can see this is a screenshot of her and the, him in the lab tech saying, I designed everything. We moved the teeth up. Are you okay with this? You see where her teeth now. He approves everything. Do that with the lab back on a Zoom call. And then the day of the procedure, for the sake of time, I'll show you the top. We can see that there were three prepared teeth. Again, there were four on the bottom. He had individual temps just sitting on them and all her regular teeth. The rest of the teeth come out. The guides are prepared to sit on the prepared teeth. And like that on the palate or the prepared teeth or both. The implants go in. Grafting is done. And then the insertion of the temporaries on the prepared teeth. She demanded and wanted a little bit lighter shade than I would have. It's fine. It never bothers me. It's a temp. She may not like it or she may go, I love this. Jay and crew make me this on my final. And that's between them. But it's cool. I'm looking at the arch form and how the gingiva healed. The interesting part was, if we look at the date at 8.30 in the morning, Cole texts me and says, here goes nothing. And I wrote, good luck. Keep me posted. Take out teeth and try the temp first, not get. Then he writes back, place the tops, taking a pair to confirm before closing up. So far, so good. First text was 831. The second text was 946. This is a general dentist who places a lot of implants who I trust. I know him well. This is not a 30-year seasoned oral surgeon with a patient asleep. How's the temp fit? Great. Starting the bottom now. Send me pics because I'm anxiously like a parent waiting there going, show me what I did. Show me what you did. Bottom six go in. How to go? Taking a pan, then closing up. This is 11.57. So in three and a half hours, we had the bottom six in, took the pan, just need to adjust the bite a little bit. Turned out fantastic. I'll send you the photos in a little. This is a dentist that a few years ago wasn't placing implants that started with singles. And we were able to break down a case in conjunction with the lab into a series of small steps. With planning, we were able to put the implants in the right positions so they will give her teeth that look more like these on the right than they do on the left. But we also know, and you can see the prepared teeth that he had here, that we had prepared one in the back, that we were able to figure out the arch form, get the implants in, did not want to immediate load. There was some grafting that needed to be done. We can have a complete separate lecture on the advantages and disadvantages of all ons and taking down a huge amount of bone reduction on young patients. This is what she wanted. She didn't want pink. She didn't want that cleansability issue with a hybrid or an FP3. And here's a dentist who very happily did a case with one visit beforehand where he prepared some teeth in conjunction with planning with the lab, was able to get this done in a few hours. So it shows with proper planning, some difficult cases can be handled we need to contact the lab and get collaborated as early as possible. Once it's in, we can't do anything other than come up with creative ways to start to do some stuff. We also have the knowledge of what can be done. It sometimes is important knowing how to do it. You don't need to sit and design a temporary on the computer. You need to know that it can be designed and the lab needs a counter model, it needs a bite, it needs a good scan, and it needs no holes in my file, or else he's not going to be able to do it. So we need to know what each other does and can do to make it easy. This is another case that I did. It's double type stage case. Patient also was seen in New York City. I'm just north. Did not want to do an all on. That was what was advised to him. So we offered him a staged approach. He has an implant on number 12. And what we decided, we were going to take three teeth, prepare them, and use the implant. Remember, the teeth are all coming out eventually. I don't have a problem connecting teeth to an implant in a provisional for a short term, particularly on a patient who's going to lose those teeth anyway. That supports the implants. Then we put some implants in, and then we'll flip them over. So if we look here, we can see where the bone loss is. We're starting to get into the realm that maybe we're going to have long teeth. Maybe we're going to have an ugly result here. So first, we talk about where we want to end. The dentist wanted three bridges, a three-unit bridge, a six-unit bridge, and a three-unit bridge on the left. So we decided we were going to prepare these three teeth first and connect them to the implant, add my implants, and when those take, 
we would add those four implants to the implant that existed, make him a roundhouse temp, and then add two more implants, and then do a final bridge with three bridges. So we do a digital smile design. Again, labs have all the software. They can sit, send a picture. <coughs> Forgive me. <clears throat> you can get this done very easily. We can start to see that he had too much, too much tooth show. So we know that we needed to intrude him a little bit, and that helped us because that bone loss now is our friend that we wouldn't have particularly long teeth. So we have the lab doing a full digital wax up. The dentist prepares the three teeth, 6, 8, 11, 12. I unscrew the crown. He just opened it up for me. We do a scan. The lab can digitally extract the remaining teeth and makes us a temp that has nine units on it. And I can make my guide. So the lab can use the same file, the same wax up to give us the provisional. The patient relatively going to be happy with it. It may not be the color they want. It may have a little gap. And then at the end, I can put the implants where we want this to be so we're not sticking through embrasures. Patient comes in. You can see the quick chair side temps that were done. I have my guide ready to go. One implant was an immediate molar, which I grafted and put a membrane so I did not put a healing cap. You can see how flaplessly it was done. And here's my provisional. And I look, and I see there's a gap here. And I go, maybe we'll have to do another provisional. I really wish it didn't. I'll see you in a week. This is what he looked like in a week. And this is what he looked like at two or three weeks. So these temps will help us contour and support the gingiva. So here we go. We have my temp sitting on the three teeth and on a tie base that's non-engaging, that's connected to his old implant. My implants are cooking and getting ready. He comes in for stage two. I only had to really do stage two on tooth 14. We scan him. And now we have... The ability, we had his original bite, and this is where digital is a killer in a great way. We could actually do this case without a counter model. If his vertical dimension of occlusion was acceptable and we were happy, we could literally send a single jaw scan to the lab. The lab will pick three or four points in the CAMS CAD software and actually line everything up so it's in perfect occlusion because the computer can identify certain landmarks when you point them out and bring it in. So even if we don't have enough teeth left now to get a bite, we don't have to start with wax rams. We don't have to start. We literally can turn around and almost send, I would check with Jay first. He may kill me for saying this. But in a lot of ways, you don't really need to worry about the bite. We design the implant born temp. Patient comes in. I take out the remaining teeth, drop two implants in. I designed this temp, the lab designed the next temp. Uh, I took a picture, sent it over to the dentist, and the dentist, who's a great dentist, said, that looks great, get him to my office, because your embrasure here looks like horrible. So we learned the lesson that even though I know it now, and I can speak the lingo, and I can communicate, this was one of the last times I spent designing any type of provisional, because you want the experts to do it. So the dentist took it off, thank God, he caught it and opened up that embrasure, because we would have killed it. He still looks great. And here's what he leaves with. He has one, two, three, four, five implants supporting his temp. He has two implants cooking. And we have spent less time than we would with an all-on. We have spent less time with him having limitations. He could eat almost anything he wants. You could see where the dentist opened up. The ginger is healing in. They do a impression at the end. You can see on the lower right, regular analog impression. Picks a shade. Gets back a verification jig, gets a soft tissue model. This goes analog. The lab made a provisional. This is a final provisional that was made prior to the implant bridge being done in a final step. So what we did was the lab made us a provisional here. You could see the colors, the contours. They can adjust the occlusion. And as a matter of fact, once the patient wears it for a few weeks, they can do an intraoral scan and send that back to the lab, and the lab can use that to make the final. And where you've made little adjustments, generally are done. You pretty much get everything that's set. So here's his final prototype, and here's the final bridge where we have three separate units. You could see non-engaging, screw mentable type where we have custom abutments that were made, but they were cemented or rooted extraorally. 
You can see that they're anodized, which is just prettier for the tissue, something you can talk to the lab about. You can also see if you're familiar with hybrids, all-ons, which I still do, and I still like doing them, but this is something I would rather have if I were the patient. Look where our screw holes are. Look at the buccolingual dimension of this bridge. Look how happy that patient is. So here's where he came in, and here's where he finished. And this is a result that when we put that last temporary in, even the one that I got yelled at for having a ridiculous embrasure between eight and nine, the wife looked at me in the recovery room and said, how soon can we do the bottom? And we actually finished the bottom and did the same case on the bottom. He travels a lot for work. He does not ever have to worry about it because these temps are really solid. They're milled, dense PMMA, and he was very happy and it was a great case. And here's where we started. Here's where we ended. So how do we put this together? If we look here, this is what's called the tie base. If we have a multi-unit, we put a tie base on the multi-unit that cements into here, similarly that sits on the multi-unit, that's a little bit different. I know we're starting, and I never got to ask Jay, maybe he can tell me later, if he's starting to get into those Rosen screws. Some of these are starting to do without inserts, but Desk, which is a company I use, I think they're a great quality. They have nice rough into the surface. They have nice emergence, and they really are very reasonable. They're available for about 30 systems. They have engaging and non-engaging. They work for both implant level and on top of multi-units, and I'm not getting anything for them to discuss with us. It's in all the libraries, and it also has what's called an elliptobase, which allows us to take a lower profile where you're tighter with teeth, where you're below the ginger, but we don't have to profile as much. It also gives us a little bit of some angled screw ability using a screw with a full torque. We have the angled screw or the formal angled screw on them that's also available in engaging and non-engaging. And very ironically, when we started, some of the companies have no angled screw non-engaging for bridges, yet they have them FDA cleared for this company. And it's kind of funny that sometimes they beat the other companies out and still to this day they beat some of them out. But these are great. If you haven't worked with an angled screw, I want to talk about that for a minute too. It allows us to adjust the angulation. Here's a case that I did, and I do a lot of angled screw because I think in the old days we put implants a little too buckle up here. And the dentist called me up and said, I did the implant on number eight. It wasn't with you as the surgeon. It was somebody else. I did a straight crown with a tie base 10 years ago, and we never had to do angled. I don't want to hear about you needing an angled tie base. I said, okay. And I took a comb beam, and I looked at the cross section. And I said, I don't know how this doesn't hurt the patient. It's sticking close to the buccal aspect here. There may even be a perforation. For some reason, it never hurt her. For some reason, it never got infected. It never bugged her. And I said, I, I can mimic that, but I'd rather not. Maybe we should put it where the bone goes, and we can get you the angled screw. So when we look at the CAT scan or the combium and cross section, again, a small PAP doesn't bug me. That's asymptomatic. We could see the flare of the maxilla. We could see that if I wanted to shoot this straight up, this is where it's cool when you go through these comb beams and you go, I don't know how teeth sit like this. The roots are kind of hanging out to the buckle right over here, and yet they are bone is all the way back here. So I sent some text pics just to him, and I said, Ira, if you want me to do it straight, I'm going to match the other side. If I do it angled and you want an angled screw, we can work. But if you do my position with a straight, you're going to be through the buckle. But if we do that angled screw, which has a little special screwdriver, we can swing that screw hole a couple of degrees in. So we go in and we get this set up and you can see my post-op comb beam. I got very safely far away from the buckle plate, you know, millimeter or so, but this was intact bone up here. The gap up here that we spoke about was fine. I grafted everything up. We scanned that up and we made a provisional. The provisional in her bite needed to be a little bit shorter because she had a kind of ground down flattish plane occlusion and we didn't want her banging on it. So she knew it was going to be a little bit shorter than her natural tooth. Here's how she healed up though at the end of two or three months and integration. Look at the stippling of the keratinized tissue. Look at the pointiness of the papillas that we have here. Do you remember what I spoke about? Look at the preservation of the buccal lingual dimension on the upper left. We don't have that concavity. And if you have the misfortune 
when you do an implant or restore an implant and you're happy. The x-ray has great bone. Your color match is great. And the patient goes, but it looks great. And you go, I can't. I use the zirconium post. It can't be great. I anodize it. It can't be great. What happens is, is the way light refracts, where it's concave, it's going to look darker. And the more we preserve this convexity, the better and the stronger the light will hit back and look more normal. The question is, at this point, we had a discussion with her. She wants to watch the other one. I'm not sure I can even recommend taking it out without creating major havoc going on. But it's been documented, and we'll follow her up on that. But that's a result that I'm proud of, and that's a result that we did using communication with the lab, using planning, knowing that if I want to do a provisionalization, I'm either going to have a screw hole through the buckle, which on a temp I'm fine with, or in this case, we didn't even have to. We were able to go and do this. And then on the final, look at the buccal lingual dimension. Look at the width. This is a normal tooth that her tongue doesn't find its way, doesn't bug, and doesn't get. So what does digital really do for us? Again, you can see two of these are implant crowns, and it's not both eight and nine. It's one of those and one other. It's really a series of tools that allows us to gather data, treatment plan, and perform dentistry more accurately, better diagnosis, and better execution. It's not a substitute for clinical skills. It's not a substitute for experience. It's not a substitute for knowledge of the implant process or the restorative process. It doesn't change the rules. You're not graded higher or lower because I did an immediate. You're not graded higher or lower because you scanned it. It makes it easy. It makes it more reproducible. Things can be done more efficiently. You can send one file to me for a guide. You can send one file to Jay to get the provisional. We can work together. Jay can do a, with all ons, which I didn't include in this, when we're starting to get into digital dentures, one of the scary parts is when you get a patient that's kind of collapsed and the teeth are proclined, and all of a sudden I'm putting my implants in going, I think I need a 30. If I need higher, I'm hosed. He can actually start to design the teeth and the file that he has becomes a real file to use as a secondary reference point for me to design where my implants go, for me to create a guide, for me to have a result that communicates that we know in advance. And it's really a nice process. Again, the end goals and the criteria for success do not change. When we understand the concepts, limitations, and techniques involved, we accomplish things better, cleaner, and more efficiently. And it's really just a lot more fun. And you just have these results that you're proud of. And you go, I spend more time taking pictures than I did five years ago. I have more camera and mirrors and retractors. Because all of a sudden, I'm like, I want to put that on Instagram. I want to show my referrals. I want to keep that for another patient. It really is a nice way to go. Remember, collaboration, data collection, planning are the key for the best outcomes.